Hello, everybody. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to start talking to you about post-cardiac surgery bleeding, uh, one of the topics that you will encounter very frequently in the cardiac surgery ICU. So the way I'm going to go about doing this is first, I'm going to talk about some risk factors for post-cardiac surgery bleeding. I'll go through an approach uh, to diagnosis, what is significant bleeding, what is considered less significant, and then I will talk about an approach to managing these patients. And I must say, you will see at least one or two bleeding patients in your rotation in the cardiac surgery recovery unit. So cardiac surgery and the coagulation cascade. Their relationship uh, is a bit of a, um, an arch nemesis relationship where, you know, it's like basically Batman and the Joker or... It's like Superman and Lex Luthor. Cardiac surgery is a bit of an enemy for the coagulation cascade, but yet they thrive on each other. When you look at cardiac surgery and the coagulation cascade, um, heparin in and of itself gives you a total arrest of the coagulation cascade to prevent clotting in the cardiopulmonary bypass. And that is actually one of the major reasons that uh, cardiac surgery has reached the stage that it's in is the advent of anticoagulation and reversal of anticoagulation as well. Cardiopulmonary bypass, uh, the circuit itself can induce platelet dysfunction or fibrinolysis. The pump prime, about one and a half liters of crystalloid, can dilute your coagulation factors in addition to other crystalloids given throughout the surgery. Cell-saving devices can deplete coagulation factors and platelets, and so you will run into coagulation issues in these patients. Some of, some of the times it's manifest and they lose quite a bit of blood and you need to actually manage it. And some of the times it's less of an issue. I'd like to talk a little bit about the history. Uh, heparin was discovered in 1916. <clears throat> However, the first attempts at cardiopulmonary bypass during the 1940s and the early 1950s were a series of disasters with an appalling mortality rate. Part of it was clotting on the cardiopulmonary bypass circuit. And then when they started implementing anticoagulation, they actually did not have protamine in these days. Heparin was available, but protamine uh, only became commercially available later on. And so a lot of these patients bled quite a bit after surgery. There was a review that was published in that timeline, in that time, about the 1950s or so, that showed that 18 patients undergoing cardiac surgery were using bypass at six different centers, 17 deaths, and only one survivor. And then protamine became commercially available in the mid-1950s, and things became a little bit better. Now you can actually reverse these patients after coming off bypass. So let's uh, tackle this topic through a case. So we have a 65-year-old male patient who is post-urgent cabbage. He comes to you in CSRU. On handover, you come to know that the patient's received aspirin and clopidogrel pre-op for his quinary angio. Intra-op, he received two units of packed cells, one unit of platelets. The surgeons tell you he was a bit oozy upon closure and cardiopulmonary bypass time was 130 minutes. You receive him post-op in the first hour, he dumps about 300 mils. And in the second, third, and fourth hours, he's consistently putting out 200 mils. What will be your approach to this patient? So let's think about this for a second here. And let's go back to our uh, framework. So we'll identify first the risk factors. We'll develop an approach to diagnosis and approach to managing these patients. <clears throat> so the risk factors, there's pre-op risk factors, and these include antiplatelets, which this patient clearly has had pre-op, ASA and clopidogrel, anticoagulants preoperatively. A lot of these patients with active angina, unstable uh, ACSs will come on heparin infusions to the OR. Some of the herbal remedies can have anticoagulant properties. If the patients have pre-op renal dysfunction, that tends to give you platelet dysfunction. If you have liver dysfunction, that can impair your coagulation factor production as well. If they have a pre-op bleeding diathesis like von Willebrand disease, hemophilia, all of these are risk factors for bleeding. There are, however, intraoperative risk factors as well, and these include bleeding. In the OR, we'll always predispose to bleeding. 
after the OR. So bleeding in the OR is a risk factor for post-op bleeding. Excessive colloid and crystalloid administration, and we mentioned pump prime. Long cardiopulmonary bypass time, and by that I mean anything greater than 120 minutes is considered long a long pump prime and can impair platelet function and impair fibrinolysis quite a bit. Inadequate heparin reversible, reversal is some, sometimes something we see uh, in the cardiac surgery ICU as well. Hypothermia in the OR, acidosis, all of these are intraoperative risk factors for postoperative bleeding. So the incidence is about 5%. So one in every 20 cases will encounter post-op bleeding. The definition that I like to adopt in the cardiac surgery ICU is uh, draining more than 400 mils in the first hour, draining more than 300 mils in the first per hour in the first two hours, draining more than 200 mils per hour in the first three hours, or more than 100 mils per hour that is consistent in the first six hours. And so it's not unusual to have a little bit of a higher drainage when they first come back from the OR. However, this is expected to settle over time. The other thing that's also quite common is that they will have a bit of a dump when they change position. When the nurses come and tell you we've changed their position and they've dumped 300 mils or we've dangled them on the side of the bed and they've dumped 300 mils, that is all okay. That is all acceptable. What you don't want to see is a consistent non uh, abating drainage that just does does not dwindle over time. You don't want to see that. And that's when you should start getting concerned. Another alternative definition to post-cardiac surgery bleeding is putting out one liter per case in the first few hours. And so when they hit the one liter mark in the first four or five hours, you should generally let your surgeons know. Now, why do we care so much about bleeding? We obviously care because of the impact on uh, on tissue perfusion, on the blood transfusion requirements that are uh, that take place, the need for surgical re-exploration after bleeding, which in and of itself is a risk factor for mediastinitis and increased rates of infection. And obviously, bleeding post-op prolongs your ICU stay. And so it's a, a resource consumption issue as well, in addition to having impact on patient outcomes. So what are the causes of post-cardiac surgery bleeding. What I was showing here in this previous video was bleeding that was, you were holding that chest drain, and you can see that the column of blood is rising up against gravity. Always a bad sign. When you have somebody who's bleeding in ICU and you elevate your chest drain and you see the column of blood rising up against gravity, that rate of output is concerning. That is a rate that you should inform your surgeons about. So <clears throat> in terms of causes, I like to break them down from a practical standpoint into medical versus surgical. And that's how the surgeons will talk. That's the lingo that you will hear in CSRU. Is it medical bleeding, do you think, or is it surgical bleeding? Medical bleeding can happen because of a, uh, a quite a few factors, residual heparin or heparin rebound. That can give you medical bleeding. Platelet dysfunction, we mentioned how uh, cardiopulmonary bypass gives, can give you platelet dysfunction. Thrombocytopenia can give you medical bleeding. Coagulation factor deficits can give you medical bleeding. Fibrinolysis can give you medical bleeding. However, when you've corrected the coagulation profile, you've corrected the patient's temperature, the acidosis, and everything seems to be in order on the blood work, and they're still bleeding, that's when you start calling it surgical bleeding. That's when you tell your surgical colleagues, okay, we can no longer call this medical bleeding. Our INR is normal, our PTT is normal, our platelets are fine, our uh, temperature is fine, our pressure is under control, our calcium's topped up, our um, everything looks good here, and yet we're still bleeding. That's when you start saying, okay, this cannot be medical bleeding. We need your help. And surgical bleeding can happen because of a bunch of things. The sternal bed can sometimes uh, bleed. Uh, the bone marrow can in and of itself actually be a source of bleeding. The chest wall tends to be a source of bleeding, especially around the lima or the lita harvest uh, area. When you see, when you look at these x-rays post-op, you'll see a lot of clips in the chest because you're clipping off the lima branches. And so 
the lima harvest bed can be a source of bleeding. The anastomotic sites on the heart itself can be a source of bleeding. The vein graft to the RCA or the CERC, or even the lima to the LAD, that can be a source of bleeding. Even the graft harvest uh, sites, and we spoke about the lima bed, but even in the legs, sometimes you can get bleeding. Not very commonly, but it can happen. And so there's a bunch of surgical causes for bleeding that you need to be mindful of. Now, um, one surgical cause of bleeding that I like to talk about uh, is AV groove disruption. Now, this is usually something uh, most of the time they'll discover in the OR. And it's a very rare complication. Well, I shouldn't say very rare. It's a rare complication of mi a mitral valve replacement. I've seen it in the CSRU. It's essentially uh, when you have the risk, the risk factors are elderly females with a very calcified mitral valve annulus. And so just taking sutures in that mitral annulus while you're replacing the valve can sometimes lead to AV groove disruption. And as you can imagine from the name, it's really just a dis disruption in the back of the heart at the level of the AV groove where the back of the heart is actually bleeding, a very tough spot to control. And so how this presents, usually in the OR, the surgeons will see the field start filling up with blood and they're not sure where the blood is coming from. Usually it's coming from the back of the heart, if that's the case. They suction, they look around, they can't find the source of blood. And if it's still filling up from the back of the heart, your diagnosis is there. You're likely dealing with AV groove disruption. It's a very high risk situation. The mortality is about 25 to 70%. A lot of times it's, it's tough to actually do any form of repair on this. Uh, I've seen one case where the surgeons really just tried to uh, put surgery seal as much as they can, left the chest open, and basically brought them over to CSRU. Ended up getting factor seven and ended up settling down over time. And this patient got her chest closed eventually. But it's a situation where you can usually face a lot of blood, and that can continue into the post op period. So let's talk a little bit about heparin rebound as a cause of medical bleeding. So uh, heparin can reappear in the central circulation after you've neutralized uh, the initial uh, heparin bolus with protamine. So coming off pump, usually the surgeons will ask for protamine after they've removed the venous cannula. So that's your hint. The surgeons now will now ask me to give protamine after they've removed the venous cannula. You, you neutralize the heparin with protamine the protamine half-life uh, is about 10 minutes or so. And so when you look at uh, four to five half-lives, you're talking about something close to 40 minutes. The half-life of heparin is a, an hour and a half. So the half-life of heparin itself is actually longer than the heparin-protamine complex. And the bad news is heparin is heavily protein-bound. And so it can re-enter the circulation after protamine eliminates the initial centrally uh, circulating heparin. And so that heparin rebound can happen in patients on pre-op infusions. They usually have a higher uh, level of protein-bound heparin uh, or with high intra-op doses, you can get heparin rebound. Almost all patients have some degree of heparin rebound. And that's been shown in a study where they actually measured in a thrombin um, clotting time, anti-factor 10A activity, protein-bound heparin, so assays that we don't typically use in our clinical practice. But in this study, they looked at what percentage of patients experiences heparin rebound, and they found that it was close to 100%. However, it's not always clinically significant. There was an RCT where they actually randomized 300 cardiac surgery patients to getting either protamine post-op for six hours as an infusion versus saline. And they found that giving protamine reduced chest tube output by about 13%, but was not associated with reduced transfusion rates. So it did not have a clinically significant impact despite reducing chest tube output. How do we diagnose it clinically when we don't have all these assays? Usually when you get a patient fresh from the OR, you'll do a fresh set of coags, and then you'll repeat the coags four hours later. If you find that the initial set of coags, the PTT was normal, 
And then the PTT started to drift up after the initial normal values. The usual cause is heparin rebound. Heparin targets the PTT. And so uh, if you're if you want to treat uh, a, a high PTT, if the patient is bleeding or at risk for bleeding, then protamine infusion will reliably eliminate this rebound. Some of our surgeons use protamine infusions routinely for all our patients. That's it's an acceptable practice, but as I said, um, uh, from an RCT or an evidence-based standpoint, it was never really shown to reduce transfusion rates. So. How do you manage excessive bleeding post-op? So um, products, blood products, you need to keep on top of your coagulation profile. You need to correct your INR, your PTT. You need to replace the lost hemoglobin. Um, try to keep their pressure on the lower side. The higher the pressure, the more they will bleed. In fact, if the pressure is really high, you'll be testing the suture lines for the surgeons. You don't want their pressure to be really high. You want the pressure, especially if they're bleeding, to be closer to a systolic of 90 to 100. You want to preserve these patients' temperatures. Hypothermia will make bleeding worse. You want to correct their acidosis. You want to top up their calcium. You want to give procoagulant drugs to these patients. Increasing PEEPs will sometimes help tamponade the bleeding. You can go up on the PEEP to 10, provided their blood pressure tolerates it. And then last but not least, a lot of these patients will have a proline deficiency issue. They need to go back to the OR to get a few sutures in place. I must say, though, if you are concerned, paid your cardiac surgeons early on. The reason is the cardiac surgeons know what happened in the OR. A lot of times they'll bring the patients over and they will have some concern in their mind about what took place in the OR. They'll have some concern in their mind about the potential for bleeding. <clears throat> Informing your surgeons early on is extremely important in, in, you know, in the subset of patients who they're bleeding a little bit excessively. They're not meeting that you know, 400 mil an hour threshold, but they're just, they're just putting out quite a bit of blood. Some of the surgeons will actually take patients back based on their knowledge of what happened in the OR. And so involve, involving surgeons early on is extremely important. So if a patient is uh, bleeding to the degree that you're having to transfuse very frequently, it'll help you quite a bit to activate the massive transfusion protocol. With activation of the massive transfusion protocol, you do not need to individually enter orders for blood products. All you need to do is ask them to send a porter to pick up blood from the blood bank. As soon as the porter picks up four units of packed cells, four units of FFP and adult dose of platelets, blood bank will know to automatically put on standby another four units of packed cells, another four units of FFP and another adult dose of platelets. <clears throat> so that will help you quite a bit in managing these patients. Instead of having to individually order pack cells, blood bank resources will put, be put on standby for your patients, and they'll automatically have units ready for you to go. We just need to send somebody to pick them up. So <clears throat> when you're running a massive transfusion protocol, do not forget to check your CBC, your INR, your PTT, and your fibrinogen after each round of transfusion. And by one round, I mean the four of pack cells, four of FFP, and one dose of platelets. If your fibrinogen is less than two grams per liter, give fibrinogen or cryoprecipitate if the patient is bleeding. Now we have fibrinogen available to us. So four grams of fibrinogen will be needed if your fibrinogen levels are low. Some of our surgeons will use 1.5 as the cutoff. Uh, there has been recent guidelines that suggest two grams per liter as a better cutoff for giving fibrinogen concentrate, especially if the patient is bleeding. One gram of calcium chloride IV per round of blood products is a reasonable ratio. And products will continue to be made available to you until the protocol is deactivated. Now you can either deactivate it by calling up blood bank, or if you do not order blood within a four hour timeline, blood bank will know to automatically deactivate the protocol. So as long as you're sending somebody to pick up units, they'll keep the protocol active. Once you stop sending people to pick up blood products for four hours in a row, 
the protocol automatically deactivates as per the LHSC uh, policies. So what procoagulant drugs can you use in a bleeding patient post-op? So protamine is one we spoke about. You can give a 50 milligram bolus and then run an infusion of 100 milligrams over four hours. That will take care of any form of heparin rebound. DDAVP is, uh, is one uh, procoagulant that you can give in the post-op period, provided they did not receive it in the OR. And the dose is 0.3 mics per kilo up to a max of 20 mics IVs, five amps of DDAVP. Each amp is four micrograms. And so that is the max dose that you can give, and it'll improve your platelet function by activating von Willebrand's factor. And so that's how it works. If you're suspecting dysfunctional platelets, give DDAVP. <clears throat> now, the evidence is a little bit um, not very strong for DDAVP. Um, and so we still give it. We still think it works. However, there has been a meta-analysis recently that says it works about 50% of the time. So, um, so it's still something we give, though, in this patient population if we're concerned and if they haven't had a dose in the OR. Now, <clears throat> pranexamic acid, you can consider giving post-op an extra dose. Usually, however, they will have had a dose in the OR. And how tranexamic acid works, it's an antifibrinolytic, prevents the fibrinolysis that can happen. Fibrinolysis destabilizes clot. And so tranexamic acid has been shown to reduce transfusion requirements. And so we will usually give it routinely in the OR in our cardiac surgery population. <clears throat> the recommended intra-op dose is a maximum of up to 30 milligrams per kilo total. So if you have a um, 70 kilogram patient, 70 times 30 is 2.1 grams total. We'll usually give an initial bolus and then run an infusion throughout the OR. As I said, it's given routinely intra-op, but if it was not given for any reason, consider giving a post-op dose. If the patient's bleeding, you can give five to 10 milligrams per kilo. Now, the, the, the one important side effect to know from tranex, uh, you know, that tranexamic acid can give you is post-op seizures. Uh, tranexamic acid can cause CNS excitation and post-op seizures, especially if there's a buildup of, of risk factors for seizures. A big dose of tranexamic acid in an elderly patient with renal dysfunction who's had, you know, ANCEF 2 grams pre-pumped, ANCEF 2 grams post-pump, which can reduce your seizure threshold. When you have all these risk factors align in a patient, you can see seizures post-cardiopulmonary bypass. And that tends to be one of the actual uh, common causes of seizures in this population is tranexamic acid in addition to all the other risk factors lining up. <clears throat> so what if all else fails? You've corrected the coagulation profile, you've corrected all the um, uh, contributors to bleeding, you've called your surgeon, surgeons say, well, I don't. there's nothing really surgically that we can do and the patient yet is still continuing to bleed. That is when you can discuss with your surgeons activated factor 7A. Now, giving blood products perpetually will deplete your resources, and there, you know, we need to reach some end point. And that's when you pull up the factor 7 card. Now, activated factor 7, <clears throat> number one, is an extremely expensive drug, and so you don't want to be giving it uh, to everybody. And the second, more important, reason you don't want to be giving it for everybody is that it has been associated with a lot of clotting side effects. Uh, and by clotting, I mean things like strokes, clotted valves. And so it's a very strong procoagulant that can induce clotting in areas where it's, it's really not uh, needed. So uh, the dose of activated factor 7 or recombinant factor 7A is 30 to 90 micrograms per kilogram. <clears throat> most of us will start at the lower end of that dose, about 30 micrograms per kilogram. And we can call that a half dose. We can even sometimes go lower than 30 mics and call that a half dose. I'll usually start at 30 mics per kilo and then give another 30 mics per kilo if needed. You're still within the recommended dose range by giving 30 mics times two or even times three. <clears throat> now, prior to giving factor 7A, uh, you need to have corrected your coags. 
you need to have made sure that your INR is less than 1.5, that your PTT is now corrected and less than 55. Your fibrinogen is at least greater than one gram per liter. Your platelet count is at least greater than 50, if not higher. Your acidosis has been corrected. Your hypothermia has been corrected. Your calcium has been topped up. And you've explored surgical options with your surgeons. If surgery is not an option, you've corrected the coags and the patients continue to bleed, then factor seven can be given in consultation with the surgical team as well. Now, <clears throat> there are certain patient populations where you're quite okay giving factor seven, like you know the fresh heart transplant patient, I'm quite okay giving factor seven to these patients. However, patients post valve replacement, I'm a little bit more hesitant because I don't want to clot off that valve post cabbage, you don't want the grafts to go down. Uh, patients on ECMO, that's one patient population where really giving factor seven is, you know, like a Russian roulette really type of thing. Uh, and so you really um, can pull out that card in the end after you've exhausted everything and uh, consulted with the surgeons. And I usually have a little bit of a discussion with family. We're giving this as a last ditch effort and we're hoping it works. If it doesn't work and we continue to bleed, then we may not have anything else further to offer. So that is usually your last ditch effort is activated factor 7A. Now, mind you, some of the surgeons will wanna give factor 7A earlier, as long as you've corrected your coags and it's in consultation with your surgeons, then you should be okay giving a half dose if that is a consensus amongst the team. Let me, uh, let me just say a word of caution here. Uh, patients with no evidence of bleeding do not need their coagulation profile treated. Say you get a patient back from the OR and their INR is 1.6, but they're not bleeding. They look fine. There was no concerns for bleeding even handed over in the OR. So you really should be treating the patient, not the numbers. If the patient not bleeding, there's really no need to correct an INR of 1.6 or 1.7 if they're not bleeding. Treat the patient, not the numbers. Now, <clears throat> if the surgeon's concerned about bleeding, then, then you may want to aggressively treat these numbers. But if there's no concern, the numbers in and of themselves may not warrant treatment. But the other thing is, if the INR is less than 1.5, like if the INR is, say, 1.4, you usually will not be able to correct that INR with FFP. In fact, the INR of uh, a unit of FFP is about 1.4. So you may not be able to bring it down lower than 1.4 with FFP. So if you're targeting that, then, then that may not be a good reason to give FFP. So that brings us to a topic that uh, has been studied and in the past few years, and I'd like to talk about a bit, and that is transfusion triggers post-cardiac surgery. Now, this may be a little bit off topic, but I think it's an important uh, something to it's an important issue to talk about, um, given the fact that there have been two big RCTs that have been published about this in the last few years. Now, the first of these RCTs was out of the UK, the Titer study by Murphy and his colleagues. And this was a multicenter RCT that included 2003 postcardiac surgery patients. They excluded patients who were massively bleeding post-op. Um, and what they did was they randomized patients to either restrictive transfusion where they would transfuse to a hemoglobin threshold of uh, less than 75 grams per liter versus a liberal transfusion threshold transfusing to greater than 90 grams per liter. As I said, they excluded patients who were massively bleeding post-op because it, it becomes a little bit more difficult to target these numbers if they're massively bleeding. The primary outcome was a composite outcome of serious infection, sepsis or wound infection, an ischemic event, a permanent stroke, an MI, an infarction of the gut or an AKI within three months after randomization. So it was a composite of, of bad events like a serious infection or ischemic event. <clears throat> but their secondary outcomes did include mortality though and cost and length of stay. So what did they find with regards to the primary outcome of serious infections and ischemic events, um, there was no difference really between a restrictive strategy of 75 and a liberal strategy of targeting 90 grams uh, uh, per liter of hemoglobin. Uh, 
the primary outcome occurred in 35% in, in the restrictive arm, 33% of the liberal arm. The odds ratio was 1.1 and the confidence interval did cross one with a non-significant p-value. The interesting thing about this study though is uh, mortality. Mortality was one of their secondary outcomes and they found that all cause mortality at six months was higher in the restrictive group compared to the liberal group. So the restrictive group, target, where they were targeted 75, the all-cause six-month mortality was actually higher than the liberal group with a, an odds ratio that was significant or the p-value that was significant as well. Uh, so uh, even though it was a secondary outcome when it's mortality, it really raises some questions there. Why was the mortality higher at six months? It was an all-cause mortality. Why was it higher at six months in the restrictive group? And the 90 uh, gram threshold seemed to fare better when it came to mortality. It was unclear. It really wasn't clear. Uh, serious post-op complications, including excluding primary outcome events, um, were similar in both groups. The total cost uh, did not differ between both groups. Um, it, it did raise the question mark, though, about, you know, whether 75 is a reasonable threshold. Um, and it gave rise to the subsequent study, which was the TRIC-3 trial. Now, the TRIC-3 trial um, was a multicenter RCT where they randomized uh, 5,243 uh, moderate to high-risk post-cardiac surgery patients uh, to the same th or similar thresholds of restrictive arm of 75 grams per liter versus liberal arm of 95 grams per liter. They also excluded massively bleeding patients. Uh, their primary outcome here was a composite of death from any cause, MIs, stroke, new onset renal failure with dialysis by hospital discharge um, or by day 28, whichever came first. So they also had a composite outcome that included death from any cause. Now, what did they find? They found that both, uh, like a restrictive was not inferior to a liberal strategy. And so um, the primary outcome occurred in 11.4 versus 12.5%. And uh, the p-value uh, indicated non-inferiority. The secondary outcomes were also quite similar. Um, All-cause mortality was similar in the restrictive compared to the liberal group. This was a larger study, 5,000 patients, much bigger than the uh, tighter study. And the secondary outcomes were similar between both groups. So their conclusion was a restrictive strategy targeting 75 was non-inferior to a liberal strategy. And so you can target 75 in this patient population. That is backed up by evidence. Um, if the patient is bleeding, however, I will usually try to stay on top of the bleeding. And my endpoints here will not be the hemoglobin as much as it will be other things like hemodynamic stability, requirement for pressors, chest tube output. All of these will factor in when you're transfusing blood products to an actively bleeding patient. So <clears throat> brings us to the last point that I'm gonna talk about here. Uh, bleeding seems to have settled. Things seem to have, the bleeding seems to have stopped. Is this a good thing? Could be, could be a good thing. But before you start giving each other high fives, you need to understand that it also may not be a good thing. When the bleeding stops, the things you need to monitor for, number one, you need to monitor for tamponade. Watch for an increase in pressure requirements, despite the bleeding having stopped. Watch for art line variability. When you see the stroke volume peaks, or the art line peaks having a lot of variation. That is what we used to call, well, well, we still call it pulseless paradoxus back in the day when we used to measure it with a cuff. You see that now with an art line. You see the variability in the art line tracing. You start seeing a lactate rise. You start seeing a urine output drop. All of that should trigger in your mind uh, uh, two things. Number one, calling the surgeons. Number two, a TEE to assess for tamponade. And so if the bleeding has stopped because the chest tubes have clotted, that may mean that there's bleeding around the heart that is giving you issues. 
The other uh, area that they may be accumulating blood is the pleura. So we need to continue to monitor hemoglobin uh, for a while after bleeding has stopped because a continued drop may reflect uh, under resuscitation is one uh, is one is one possibility that you're just behind on blood products. But the other possibility is that they may continue to be bleeding into the chest. Their chest tubes have clotted, but they're just accu accumulating in the pleura. And so if that's what you're thinking, order a chest X-ray and a POCUS may be helpful. And so bear in mind these two possibilities when the bleeding has stopped. Um, watch for tamponade, watch for bleeding into the pleura. Have a low threshold to do a TE. If you start seeing uh, features of tamponade, have a low threshold to repeat an X-ray. If you feel like the bleeding is just continuing uh, and then, however, it's just not visible to you externally. Now, this is um, <clears throat> a patient where the bleeding had, quote unquote, stopped. And you can see here, this is a mid uh aortic valve short axis view, where you can see that the right atrium here, the right atrial free wall is convex. This is not normal. The right atrial free wall is usually, uh, sorry, it's, it's here is concave. Usually it's convex outwards. It's usually not flat and it's usually not concave like this. So there's clearly outward compression on that right atrium. And when we go to the bicaval view, this is a very impressively compressed right atrium. You see the left atrium here in the near field, the interatrial septum. The right atrium is quite clearly compressed with a clot. And so let me conclude by mentioning a few take home points. Uh, number one, involve your cardiac surgery colleagues early on if you're concerned. They will know what happened in the OR, and sometimes they'll have a low threshold to take patients back, even if their output is not, uh, is not really that uh, large. Uh, most bleeding will be considered medical until coags are corrected and the patient continues to bleed. So by default, your friendly surgical colleagues will call the bleeding medical until they see a set of coags that is normal, until they see an INR, a PDT that is normal, a platelet count that is normal, um, <clears throat> a platelet a patient that has a normal temperature, a normal calcium, and everything else has been corrected. Only when you've corrected everything and they continue to bleed is when uh, you'll likely be able to pick up the phone and say, I think this is a surgical bleed. Administer products and procoagulants, control blood pressure, um, target a systolic of about 90, 90 to 100 at the most, normalize the metabolic milieu, stay on top of the bleeding. Factor 7a can be given as a last resort. You may want to increase your PEEP if the pressure tolerates it to 10 to tampon add the bleeding. Can you continue to monitor patients if the bleeding stops? They may be heading into other issues. And so these are my references and uh, I'm open to all your questions and comments. Hi, Dr. Hegazim. Um, Malcolm here. Nice to see you, of course. Likewise. Um, quick question. What do you think about using pulse pressure variation in the in the non-ventilated patient in CSRU. Like I feel like I put it up sometimes when it's the ventilated patient, but when it's the non-ventilated patient, I know the evidence isn't really there yet. I just wanted to wonder what your thoughts were in behind that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, uh, you're absolutely right there. I mean, the 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 cutoff for 15% variation was validated in patients who were passive on the ventilator taking more than eight mils per kilo tidal volume or in sinus rhythm. So obviously once they're in AFib, that variation goes out the window and uh, who had normal intra-abdominal pressure. So yes, you're absolutely right. The, that cutoff is really, was really developed for that patient population. However, I do, I do look at the trend, I must say. Um, <clears throat> even in spontaneously uh, breathing patients, I will look at the trend of stroke volume variation and take it in context with everything else. Um, you know, if you have a rising lactate, a low urine output, and, uh, you know, a patient who looks like they're shutting down peripherally, and the stroke volume variation is high, well, uh, 
that definitely uh, is, you know should ring uh, bells and whistles. But um, yeah, you know, is the cutoff valid for spontaneously ventilated patients? We don't know, but I do think the trend gives us um, gives us a good indicator for where this patient is heading. I, I use it to be quite honest, and uh, I don't know what your thoughts are, Osama. Do you have any? Any different thoughts about this? I personally will will look at pulse pressure variation, even in spontaneously breathing patients or extubated patients. Yeah, actually, yeah, I I agree with you. I will do, especially having like a trend that will be usually um, a good approach for lots of uh, like controversial uh, um, even things we have or we think about. But definitely, I will use the pulse pressure variation uh, almost in all patients. That's great. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Just one question regarding thromboelastogram and compared with the conventional method, we are measuring like BT, BTT, and INR. Is there any evidence showing that superiority of thromboelastogram compared with uh, normal coagulations uh, parameters? Yeah, that's an that's an excellent question. There is evidence. I didn't I didn't actually go through the study here, but there is evidence to show that. TEG reduces your transfusion requirements, uh, whether it is thromboelastography or rotational thromboelastometry, ROTEM, both will give you similar information. And uh, they have been shown to be superior uh, to our conventional methods when it comes to transfusion requirements. Uh, you tend to transfuse less when you're depending on ROTEM. And ROTEM will give you information that conventional um, uh, conventional lab work will not give you. Like for example, platelet function. Platelet function will be reflected on the strength of the clot and you don't get platelet function uh, by ordering a CBC. However, Rotem will give you an indication of platelet function. Rotem will give you an indication whether fibrinol lysis is an issue, uh, how quickly the waveform tapers out. If it tapers out too quickly, then fibrinol lysis is an issue then maybe giving tranexamic acid may help this patient. Um, and so is Rotem uh, a good tool to use in this patient population? Absolutely it is. I do think it is good. However, there are some logistic challenges about uh, its implementation. Uh, mind you, I feel that, that the institutions that have successfully implemented uh, Rotem-guided transfusions have usually delegated running Rotems to the core labs. Uh, the Rotem machine is housed in the core labs. You send off the sample, it goes, it's run in the core labs and you get the results on power chart right there. Uh, the, less the, more, the less responsibility you put on the shoulders of the intensivist and the anesthesiologist, the more reliable the service will be. Because if you're telling the intensivist you need to go and run the sample yourself or the anesthesiologist need to go and run the sample yourself, well, that's a lot of time that they may not afford. They may not be able to do uh, you know, away from the ICU or, you know, tied up beside a machine. And so, unfortunately, the model that, you know, we had a Rotem machine, and I think it may be back in service, I'm not sure. But, um, uh, but unfortunately, we still run it. And so, you know, the less burden you throw on the shoulders of us, I think the more successful the implementation of Rotem guided transfusion will be. And obviously, you need to train people on how to look at the tracing and what the tracing uh, really means. Um, and the different parameters. And so, uh, yes, is Rotem a good thing to use? I, I do think it is. There is evidence to show that it is good. However, the logistic challenges of implementation, uh, I think we need to be practical if we are thinking of implementing Rotem across the board and making it you know, housed in core labs would be my take. And that is something that I had discussed um, with leadership. Uh, I don't think it really went anywhere back when, you know, back when I was uh, looking into it. Yeah, can I give you uh, one example for supporting what you said? Um, recently, I got a patient from OR who was like bleeding, but unfortunately, they didn't run a Rotem test because of the two machines we have in the in OR. They were in use and busy, mm -hmm. so they decide, okay, I'm going to bring the patient back to CSRU without doing Rotem, despite like we thought this is an indication. 
So as you mentioned, sometimes if you have the responsibility, you, you don't have the luxury of time or you can't leave your patient, so then you will postpone it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I agree. I agree. No, I know. I know. Hi, Dr. Hey, does he... Oh, hey, can you Brit. hear me? This is Brittany. Hey, I hey. just wanted to throw it out there. Um, the, the eventual plan for our tag is to actually train all or most of our red, uh, respiratory therapists so that we can send them to run the tag. It's just going to take time to get all of them trained on it, um, which would hopefully help with what you're talking about, so that you're not taking the intensivist or on-call fellow or uh, most responsible provider away from the bedside to do the test. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So hopefully we can get to a point where RTs will do it. Well, that's good. That's good.